heard it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Aisha Solomon. I am the Alatra County Property Appraiser. I would like to first thank everyone who signed up to be a part of our first probate and estate planning webinar, as it serves as a follow-up to our previous probate and estate planning summit. I would like to also thank each of you, uh, each one of our panelists for being here tonight. Tonight, we have the following representatives as panelists. Jean Spearbeck, representing the Alatra County Clerk of the Court. We have Charlotte Bella Lanes, uh, representing the Alatra County Property Appraisers Office, GIS and Title Department. We have Chelsea. Bakaitis, I like her last name, representing the GCRA. Rachel Rawls, representing Three Rivers Legal Services. We have the Alatra County Commissioner, Anna Prezia. Um, Danaya Wright, representing the UF Law School. And Lolly Gomez. Gomez Roberts, representing the Alatra County Property Appraisers Office. She is the Director of Public Service and Exemptions Department. Before we begin, I would like to provide you all with an overview of how this webinar will begin. We will begin with, this, this session will be recorded and is subject to later use by all entities involved to use at their own discretion. To provide you with a little bit of background about this project, one of the core values I ran my campaign on was being community focused. This means that our office strives to engage with the community both strategically and directly. This includes providing additional virtual platform opportunities to engage with the public. Tonight, each panelist will share a little bit about their offices and how they're involved in these processes. Once complete, I will read off a pre-submitted question participants submitted during the registration process. Participants can also ask questions in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen. However, please provide a pre-submitted, however, please be advised pre-submitted questions will be answered and questions in the Q&A chat box will be answered in the order received as time may allow. Thank you, we will begin. Very good, share screen. Slide. Sure. All right. Um, so I'm Jean Spurbeck. I'm general counsel of the Alachua County Clerk's Office. Uh, the clerk's primary role in probate proceedings is really to handle filings that are being made. Um, the clerk has a peripheral role in uh, dealing with tax deed sales. The clerk actually handles the actual sale process and any surplus proceeds, which is where we deal with air, heirs property most often when we're doing with dealing with uh, tax sale proceeds. We have a site, uh, uh, a probate page on our website, and this most of the information I'm about to give you is on our website. Generally probate, and I saw that a lot of the questions talked about probate versus estate. Probate is the process by which a person's estate, which is their property, uh, gets distributed or paid out or deeded to heirs or beneficiaries, the payment of any um, creditors' debts, and the court oversees that process. Uh, petitions for uh, probate need to be filed where the decedent, that's the person who died, uh, is a resident. And uh, if they're not a Florida resident, where it's located, where the property is located. So there are a number of different proceedings. Um, there's a couple of small type of types of proceedings that don't really don't really affect real property. The you can check out what other kinds of proceedings there are and what's required for them on the um, Eighth Circuit's 
web page, which has a whole list of forms and checklists. Um, even though uh, there are other proceedings, only these two, one is formal administration and the other is summary administration, allow for the distribution of real property. So formal administration is used when there are either a lot of assets or it's necessary to appoint a personal representative. Um, and that has to be filed by an attorney licensed to practice law in Florida, unless the person filing it is the only beneficiary. Summary administration is a smaller, easier process. And you can file that when either the estate, entire estate does not exceed $75,000, or if the decedent has been deceased for more than two years, um, this uh, $75 limit excludes exempt property and homestead property is exempt property. So if the estate only has a homestead property and then, then it would be qualified for summary administration. So wills um, are required to be deposited with the clerk within 10 days after the person knows about the death of the maker. So if uh, you've been given a will to um, hold, then you wanna make sure that gets filed with the clerk. You do wanna deposit that where the person resided so that if there is an estate filed, they'll be able to match the will up with the probate. Um, we do not take wills unless we have a proof of death since a new will can be made at any time during the testator's life. There's, probate can sometimes be complicated, lots of complicated, um, terms, one of which is domicile, which is where the person usually resides. Um, estate, which we talked about, that's the property that's subject to being administered. The next of kin, that is heirs, the heirs of law. Personal representative is the person appointed to administer the estate. Um, some people are used to the word uh, executor or administrator, but in Florida, it's a personal representative. Um, usually these probate proceedings get filed, initiated, or started with a petition, which is just a request asking the court to enter an order. Um, the probate of a will simply means that the will gets admitted and then the property is distributed in accordance with the terms of the will. And then property is just uh, any interest in either real or personal property, and personal property can be anything like money stocks, bank accounts, and then obviously real property is um, mostly what we're talking about tonight. That's all I have. Good evening. My name is Charlotte Valvelanes and I work at the Property Appraiser's Office in the GIS Mapping and Title Department. And our role in the probate process is that the process has been completed in probate court and the documents have been recorded in the clerk's office. The two documents we look for are the order determining homestead status, shared here, and or the order of summary administration. Again, these orders come to us after the probate process has been completed. The orders are signed by a judge and then recorded in the clerk's office. The two orders I mentioned will have the deceased's name, the legal description of the property they owned or had interest in, and the heirs who are now receiving the property and the percentage of ownership. Another process um, is estate planning. Estate planning is done by deeds and uh, they're used to avoid the probate process. Again, we have received copies of the deeds once they are completed, um, usually and preferably by a real estate attorney and recorded in the clerk's office. There are different options for uh, estate planning that uh, you would want to uh, consult a real estate attorney um, <clears throat> to see which one would be beneficial to you. <clears throat> Once we receive the recorded deed, we will update our records accordingly. Also with the orders, we'll use those to update our records. 
Now we do <clears throat> receive questions uh, concerning probate. Um, one is how do I get my name on the property that was owned by my relative who is now deceased? Another we get is I pay taxes on this parcel. When will my name be put on the title? Estate planning questions, how do I add my children or others to the property? These questions will be answered by our panel here tonight. And if you have any questions after tonight, please feel free to contact our office at any time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Am I up next? I guess so. I thought it was, okay. yeah, I think it's you and then Rachel. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, let me do. Green is going crazy. All right. Let me um, share my presentation. All right, so uh, again, welcome everybody. I work for the city of Gainesville in the community reinvestment area department. Um, today, I'm just gonna talk with you guys quickly about a new program we just opened up in January that we're really excited to share. Um, this program offers free uh, probate assistance for heirs property. The mission of our program is to grow individual family wealth and access to property ownership. Um, getting your name on the deed of a title um, allows the home to become an asset. If the home isn't, if you, the deed is not uh, probated, then the heirs to the property can't use the home as collateral. Um, they can't, they can't apply for um, government grants like home rehabilitation loans. And so really getting the property probated uh, really makes it an asset to uh, heirs owners. Uh, all right, so I'm just gonna go over the application steps really quick. So to apply for our program, you need to live within this area. Uh, the map that I'm showing on the screen, the neighborhoods that those include are Fifth Avenue, Pleasant Street, Porters, Spring Hill, Sugar Hill, North Lincoln Heights, uh, Cedar Grove Two, and Duval. Um, and you need to make at um, most 120% of the Gainesville median income. And I can work with you individually to find out if you're eligible um, in this area and also through your income. If you're not, if you don't live within this area, um, don't worry, you can still apply to Three Rivers program. Um, uh, Rachel Rawl is going to be speaking later, uh, and their program covers all of Alachua County and uh, several counties outside of Alachua as well. So all you got to do is fill the application, provide some income verification. We just need your name, uh, the address, the heir's property, and information about your income and household. So just fill out the application um, and submit it. Here's my contact information. Please give me a call. Uh, you can download it on your website, or you can pick up an application, or you can email me and I'll email you an application. Um, if you prefer, you can, uh, you can always request for me to mail it to you as well. So after you submit it, um, I review your application and I approve it within 30 days. And then after it's approved, I, um, I give your application to one of the attorneys that we've hired. We've hired uh, Three Rivers Legal Services and Lippus Matthias. So you'll, you'll uh, receive services and one of these attorneys will, from these firms will call you and discuss the application. Uh, things that they're going to start asking for, which you might want to, documentation you might want to start looking for is um, you want to first create a family tree and identify the names and addresses of all the descendants um, from the heir's property. Then you want to obtain a property deed the current the property deed, and then you want to obtain the death certificate of the deceased family member. All right, and that's all I have. Uh, thank you again for coming out. If you have any questions, you can um, call me at uh, 
this number or email me on the screen. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share, but if you need that information, I can always uh, put it, uh, we can maybe put it in the chat. Okay, my name is Rachel Rawl. I am with Three Rivers Legal Services. I am the Associate Managing Attorney for our Jacksonville office. Many of you may know that we have offices in Gainesville, Jacksonville, and Lake City. Uh, like Chelsea mentioned, Three Rivers covers 17 counties in the North Florida area. Um, Alachua is one of those. So if for some reason you do not fit into the GCRA's area, uh, then you can apply to Three Rivers. Uh, we do, our, our mission is to help low-income families keep their homes um, within the families. Uh, so many of my um, speakers here have talked about probates. What I'm going to do just real quick is talk about what's next after probate. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, so what's next after probate? Probate in layman's terms is if the decedent left a will, a last will and testament, you're considered to be testate. Uh, the judge will determine whether that last will and testament is valid. If the decedent did not leave a will, that's called intestate. And the judge has to determine who the heirs are um, of the decedent and then, um, then we look at the assets. But after or before we get to that point um, in either place is what is the last will and testament? Well, it's exactly what it says. It's the decedent's last testament as to who they want their stuff to go to. Um, when you're named in a will, you're considered a beneficiary. If there's not a will, then it's considered an heir. Uh, but this is where you get to tell the world who you want to have considered your heirs and where you would like your property to go. A will must be typed written. Will, handwritten wills in Florida are void. So you have to have them typed. They must be signed by two witnesses um, who were in the room at the same time watch you sign. So all three of you have to sign it at the same time. Those witnesses are testifying when we have put them under oath is that you making the will are of age, meaning you're over 18. Um, you're a fairly sound mind. That means you know what day it is, you know who your children are, um, you know where you are, and that you all are in the same room at the same time. You should list who your heirs are, who you're married to, or if you're single, if you're divorced, if you're widowed, at the time you are making this will, you need to put down who your children are. If you leave somebody out, you could be opening up that will for um, a contest because somebody's going to come along and say, oh, I'm the favorite child and mom would not have left me out, so she must have not been her right mind to make that will. You want to state who's going to inherit your property and make a statement, not, well, I would like and maybe and if this and if that. You have to make affirmative statements. Otherwise, it just becomes a wish list. And then you also want to provide for alternate people to inherit if your first choices have passed away before you. You want to state who your personal representative is, or as it was said, we call them personal representatives, not executors, but we always understand what the person is talking about. You, in order to point someone as personal representative, if they are a family member, they can live anywhere. They have to be over 18. Um, if you're going to appoint a friend to be your personal representative, they have to be a Florida resident and remain a Florida resident throughout their service as the personal representative. So if they move in the middle after they've been appointed by the court, uh, they're no longer eligible to act as a personal representative. Um, in, no, in no event can a person be convicted of a felony, have a felony conviction, or convicted of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of an elderly person or a disabled adult. 
And although Florida law does not require that the, the will be notarized, it's a good idea because we don't have to then track down your witnesses to come to court and testify that they were in the room with you at the same time. Um, so it's, an, it, it's best practice uh, that the will be notarized. And not to plug the legal field, but you really, really, really need to consult an attorney before you try to do estate planning. Um, I have so many times had clients come in who thought they had everything in, in place. They did a trust, they did a will, they did the deeds, only to find out that everything was done wrong. Um, and so you end up back at square one when you're trying to find air split property um, and not meeting the wishes of your deceased loved ones. Um, so please consult an attorney at least. Um, Three Rivers, as I said, we, we do. Um, you have to qualify for our services just as you do for the city, but we can at least um, help you out in that um, in that situation. Thank you. I think I might be next. So I'm going to go ahead and go. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Hello everyone, um, hopefully you can see that okay. I'm Anna Prezia, I'm a Latcher County Commissioner and um, I'm the least educated on this topic on this call. Um, I have a passion for this because I see its impact on families. Um, I've, I've personally had to speak with folks throughout our county who are, you know, said, I'm, I'm paying the taxes, I'm the only one who's paying the taxes. I have 75, air scattered all over the country. We don't even know who some of them are. How can I, you know, how can I get a hold of the property? And I just, I see the, the devastating effects of heirs property on families um, losing their homes or having to split up their homes. And, and I see in our urbanized areas, you know, developers and, and other individuals taking advantage of the situations to, you know, get a hold of a, an interest in the property, you know, with one of the many heirs that wants to sell their share and then, you know, sort of forcing the hand of the other heirs to, to sell. And so I, I just want to see this um, get resolved for our families uh, throughout the county and really encourage that estate planning side that um, Rachel spoke about. And so what we're trying to do with the county, um, we're in the process now of um, working with our self-help clinics. So at the circuit court in, um, in Gainesville, we have a self-help center, which is a place where folks who do not have um, attorney representation can go to do research um, and get pointed in the right direction um, to help figure out how to represent themselves. Um, and historically, we've primarily been focused on family law, things like divorce or child custody, um, although they can help people with other, other issues. Those have been the primary focuses of folks that have come forward. But more and more, we've been seeing probate um, and heirs as a, as a big issue. And so we're trying to set up a clinic that would happen at the self-help center um, that, and to partner with uh, Dr. Wright, who's on this call and we'll be speaking in a minute at the law school and perhaps other faculty at the law school um, and Three Rivers and the Bar Association to provide people some assistance with that, those first steps of doing the research they need to do in order to, and to fill out the basic paperwork that they need to get moving on estate planning and or um, to identify resources that may be able to help them with estate planning um, and their and any heirs property issues that they have. So we're hoping to have at least a pilot launched this spring. Um, so very, very soon, we're in March now. So hopefully by April, we'll have a pilot that we can um, give a try to um, and have some help set up in the self-help center. And we will definitely send out information if folks registered for this uh, session or came and signed up for the mailing list at the event. 
we will send out information as soon as we have that clinic set up. And in the meantime, we do encourage you to reach out to Three Rivers um, and to the city of Gainesville if you're in the CRA area for that assistance um, or to come by the self-help center um, and we can do the best we can to provide you some assistance. Um, but with that, what I would like to do is turn over um, the, my, the rest of kind of talking about some of the future of uh, Ayers property and ways that we can hopefully in the future make this less cumbersome for families to Dr. Denea Wright. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I want to share my screen as well. Let's see if this is actually going to work. Um, oh, that's not what I wanted it to show up as. Um, it always does this. Why is it that one and not the other one? That one, let's try that one. There we go, that looks good. Nope, same thing. Well, anyway, um, so I'm a professor. I apologize, I tend to talk a lot. I'm gonna be as fast as I can on this. Um, but first I wanna basically talk on two different issues. What can you do to pr better protect your property for your heirs if you are a homeowner? And then what can they do once you die to protect it better for themselves? Because we have this image of dying in test state means you're kind of throwing all your property away into this deep canyon. Um, but if you have a legal will or a trust, you can kind of get it over that hump. But it, it's actually um, a little more complicated than that, unfortunately. So to begin, I so dear, okay, not looking, sorry. Uh, let's get back to the correct, this one. Why is it not, why is my? Mm. Do you have two screens? I do. Okay, so when you click on share screen, you should get something that says screen one or screen two, or, or it shows the presentation. You're gonna to wanna to actually pick the screen it's on versus oh. what you see. Let's try this one. No, it's still doing that. Okay, all right, one more and then I'm gonna stop and just make it happen. Um, all right, well, we'll just go to this. So um, I, a lot of people are gonna tell you that if you own your own home, you've gotta do better estate planning. Um, there's really four things that you can generally do in the, in the realm of estate planning. Uh, four options you have other than doing nothing, which is the fifth option. So one is to create a revocable trust. Um, that retitles the home in the name of yourself. As a trustee, you name someone else as a successor trustee. You write down in the trust document what you want to have happen, and the successor trustee takes care of it all. And trusts are really, really nice for um, you know, creating that smooth bridge from the current owner to the next owner's. Another option is the joint tenancy with right of survivorship deed. It's easier to do, it's called a poor man's will. Um, upon your death, your joint tenant simply proves title and retitles the property in their own name. Um, easy peasy, but a little, mm, can, can be a little questionable. Um, if you, it's, and it's, it's, not, it's not the ideal. Um, the third option is this ladybird deed. You can execute a deed retaining a life estate plus this general power to manage and dispose. Um, but grant a contingent remainder to your beneficiary that becomes possessory upon your death. Very simple, very nice. Um, or you can write a will where you designate an executor and pass the house to your beneficiaries. Now, what are the pros and cons of each of these? The revocable trust is great. Smooth transition, no probate needed. So Jean, nice to know you, but we're not gonna need that probate. Um, and your property can be managed during incapacity. It's really great if you have lots of pieces of real property, multiple pieces of real estate, um, but it's expensive, right? It's five to $10,000 up front, but that's it. Once you do it, hopefully um, it's done. The joint tenancy deed, very smooth transition, no probate, joint tenants already on the deed. You may even be able to do that without a lawyer, the way we don't recommend it, um, but you give up control during life. Um, and the joint tenancy deed is really only best if you've just got one piece of property and one beneficiary that you wanna have taken and you trust that person. The ladybird deed is similar. It's a little better than the joint tenancy deed. Smooth transition, no probate. You keep control of the whole thing. Um, you can sell if necessary. It's again, very low cost, 500 to $1,000. You definitely need to go to a lawyer for that. 
Um, and you really shouldn't use it if you have more than one or two beneficiaries. And this is where we, we sort of run into this problem. If you've got five children and you wanna benefit all of them, um, what do you do? The Lady Bird deed, any of these, uh, the deeds, the joint tenancy of the Lady Bird deed are really only good if you've got just one or maybe at most two beneficiaries. If you've got lots of beneficiaries, you probably want to go to the will. So the idea of a will is you distribute the property to multiple beneficiaries. You can spell out who gets the TV and who gets the stereo. Um, you can divide it up between lots of people, but that will is going to require probate, right, which um, Jean Spurbeck talked to you about even if the house is the only asset you have. So if you only have one asset that really has to be probated, you might want to think about one of the other options. Um, moreover, the will is actually probably the most expensive option here because the cost is gonna be in the neighborhood of probably three to 5,000 um, to get the will executed. Plus then on the other end, your heirs are gonna need, your beneficiaries are gonna need to do probate. So, you, if you are an owner of property, you want to think about what's out there. The, four, the fifth option is, of course, to do nothing, um, which means that all the cost is at the back end with the probate uh, by your heirs, and that's, and that's an expensive, difficult process. So what do you do if you're an heir and your ancestor has died? Well, you want to locate a will. You want to make a list of all the property. You want to collect papers on everything, bank accounts, retirement accounts, personal property, any real estate, the car, the $5 million Picasso painting I'm sure you have in your garage, all of that stuff, you want to make a list of it, determine which assets are going to pass automatically, determine who the legal heirs are in order of priority. Um, and I've listed them there, surviving spouse, lineal descendants, parents and siblings, grandparents, aunts and uncles. Um, that's the order if you don't have a will. But if you have a will, whoever you designate in your will, will will get to take your stuff. You're gonna to need to, if you're the heir, identify any debts that are outstanding. Um, and then what are you gonna do? Well, you're probably gonna to need to hire a lawyer and open probate proceedings. So all property that's owned to death outright and individually by the deceased is subject to probate proceedings, but only property with record title must be probated in order to transfer to the new owners. So for most people, that will be just the house which is why those other mechanisms may be better. If you've got lots of stuff, you've got you know, the tractor and the car and the painting and the garage and three pieces of property, the will, go with the will, um, or maybe go with a trust. But, but you know, it, so it depends, which is why you ought to talk to a lawyer. Um, probates, court supervised process um, to get the property correctly titled in the name. Any beneficiary named in a will and any legal heir is entitled to open probate proceedings. So if you know that you are potential heir of grandma's house um, and nobody's done anything on it, you can go do something about it if you're one of the beneficiaries uh, or you think you're one of the beneficiaries. Um, and all legal heirs are gonna have to be notified so they can protect their interests. Um, so what do you do once probate's complete? Okay, once you get the property then retitled in the name of you and maybe your siblings, be sure you pay your taxes and mortgage payments so you don't lose that inheritance, right? Do take care of it. If there are multiple co-owners, discuss a, ma a, a management plan uh, for managing the property. So you, whether you decide to sell it or rent it or who's going to pay expenses, but talk to your co-owners um, in the hopes that you can avoid a partition sale. And then guess what you have to do? Get on the treadmill and create an estate plan for yourself. Um, and then what happens? Guess what? You get to sleep well at night because you have done your estate planning. So what can UF do to help? Um, UF, the College of Law, we have a number of things as um, Anna Prizia mentioned, we are trying to, we're trying to develop a self-help clinic so, so people um, can come and get some assistance at the courthouse. We are also trying to stop heirs property by doing estate planning. Um, yeah, uh, that limits takers in the next generation. So what we're trying to do is get people to use what's what we hope is gonna be approved, this Florida transfer on death deed. Um, that's gonna be closer to the joint tenancy deed, but have the effect of the Ladybird deed and hopefully won't even require that you go to a lawyer. Although if I say that all the lawyers in the room cringe, but the idea is, Let's come up with a really simple process for heirs' property. 
um, for, for property to transfer. Now, it's great, again, like I said, one beneficiary. You don't want to put your five kids and seven grandkids on that transfer on death deed because it's just going to be complicated. This is where you want to limit the takers in the next generation, which is going to make the probate property process easier. We, all, we also have a whole lot of property that's currently in heirs property status, and we need to get that property probated and into the names of the living heirs. Um, and so that's where I, I come to you where I'm trying to draft legislation to make the probate process easier. And so I wanna to talk to you about maybe why you haven't done it if you're one of the heirs who has not done probate. Um, and then the third step is to prevent the house being, um, being sold or one heir being able to force a partition sale. And that fortunately, the Florida Partition of Heirs Property Act was passed in 2020. It's not gonna solve every problem, but it's going to help protect this property. Um, so what, what can you do to help us and what can we do to help you? One, do not stick your head in the sand, right? You want to do something, um, to help get your property over that, over that giant abyss. And we also want, um, and, but, it, but we want you to help us figure out how we can fix the problem. So if you can tell us me at this point, why you haven't probated your ancestors' property. It helps me to figure out how to draft legislation. So all these reasons I have there in red, you hate lawyers, you fear probate, it takes too much time. All of these reasons are good reasons for not doing it. Uh, well, they're understandable reasons. They're not good reasons. Um, so I, I, I need to know what we can sort of solve and what we can't. Um, so I can't help the fact that people might not trust the government, but I certainly could help in draft legislation, um, the fact that you might wanna be compensated for taxes that you've paid. So I need to hear from people who are, who are heirs and have not done the probate process necessary to get it over that, over that hump. But remember the, the person you know, the current owner has an obligation and whatever you can do up front is going to be cheaper in the long run. Then your heirs are gonna to have to do certain things. You can, the owner can do a lot to avoid or to minimize what the heirs have to do, but they can't do it all. The heirs are gonna to have to do some work, which may be probate, it may be just, you know, taking charge of it. Um, and then the whole process starts all over again. And so there's so many opportunities for land to be lost because it just every, every generation, we have to go through this process. So thank you. And if you want to participate in this, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention was that, yes, we are trying to get the self-help center, self-help clinic, clinic up and running. Um, and it will, we're, we're talking about it. Unfortunately, I'm not a licensed lawyer, so I can't be the supervisor, but I have a lot of opinions about it and I have some sway with students. So trying to get that started. But thank you. Thank you. And I will stop here. And I think I'm last. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Like I said before, we will read off the pre-submitted questions participants submitted during the registration process. Participants can also ask questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, pre-submitted questions will be answered first. And then the Q and A uh, chat box will be answered in the order that it was received. So we'll answer as many questions as we can, as time would allow. Okay, the first question we have is, should probate and or estate be included in the will? I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your estate, as, as many of the um, panelists have mentioned, your, your estate is your stuff. Um, probate is the process. So you are in essence, when you have a will, that's what you're doing. You are directing the process of probate by determining who your heirs are, determining what your property is and who's going to get what, appointing a person asking the court to appoint a personal, a personal representative. When you pass away, you don't have the ability to tell the court what you want. 
but that's what the will is doing is telling the court how your probate your probate estate is what we call it how the probate process is going to go the way you want it to go thank you rachel um the next question is my mother has passed and i am the only child no one is living in the house and i'm paying taxes and the house is paid what do i need to do probate okay <laughs> how down <laughs> See Jean Spurbeck at the Alachua uh, County Clerk's Office, and she will uh, hopefully tell you how to start the process. Go to Chelsea and apply if you're in the GCRA. There you go. <clears throat> or you can apply with Three Rivers and, and see if you qualify for our services. Um, understand for all participants, understand that floor, uh, Three Rivers, we do not charge for our, for our, um, for our services. Uh, if you qualify for our service because you're within a certain income, um, we do have some other grants that are um, not income based and uh, we talk to you, figure out what's best we can do for you um, or Chelsea will approve you and send you to us. All right. Thank you, Rachel. The next question is power of attorney, healthcare proxy. How do they work? That's really not a conversation for this forum because we're just talking about probate. Um, I can tell you quickly, um, they are what we call advanced directives. How do you want to be treated at the end of your life? Um, a healthcare surrogate just is you appoint somebody to help you um, make your healthcare decisions if you are unable to do that. Um, whether you're in a coma, you're in surgery, um, or you just need someone to help you. And that's what those are for. I just want to point out that powers of attorney are not effective after you die. So they are not a substitute for estate planning or a will. They die when you die, when you're, when the principal dies. Maker dies, yeah. All right. Thank you, Jane and Rachel. The next question is, how can I purchase probate estate property in Alachua County? Um, not... I, can, I can tell you that we get requests all the time for, you know, people want listings of uh, uh, probate estates that have property in them, and there isn't any real easy way to do that. You can, you can actually go online and look at all the probate filings that there are, and then you can uh, open up the petition to see if there's any real property, but there's no easy way to know what properties are in the process of being pro uh, probated. And I get contacted all the time from people who are mining the probate. <laughs> yeah. and remember, our purpose, especially here tonight and on our project with Chelsea, our purpose is to help you keep your family property in your family. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's our goal is to keep these not to not to provide an avenue for sale of the property, but to keep this family in the in the family. Well, and I guess I, I would further say that I think a secondary goal is to get you planning your estate so that if your heirs do want to sell the property, um, you know, if that's a if that's an avenue to wealth building and they're going to get, you know, the, the benefit of selling that property and inheriting the, the proceeds of that sale, we want you to get the full sale price out of that property and not to be forced to a tax sale on the courthouse steps or be forced into a sale where not everyone can agree and 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 you have uh what i consider to be a you know an interested party but that came in that isn't a part of the family um that wouldn't have been an interested party but bought their way into an interest in the property by purchasing one of the many heirs shares of the property and then forcing a sale in a situation um and at a time potentially when the property's value might be lower than it might be at other times so i just I think the, you know, yes, we would love for those families to stay in their home and for, you know, neighborhood cohesion to remain um, in areas, particularly in areas in East Gainesville where we're seeing, you know, displacement and gentrification happening really rapidly. But we also want to make sure that if people do decide to sell their property, that they can do that and get the maximum benefit from it. And that's what estate planning is all about. Thank you, Anna. The next question is, how can I apply for a tax exemption? 
Um, I'll take over that one, Anisha. Um, good evening. So, because tonight it's all in relations to heirs property and probating homes, my usual answer to this would be, well, you're an owner, you bring in proofs of residency on the home and we'll fill out an application. It gets a bit more complicated when we're dealing with a property that's an heirs property in order to claim homestead exemption. So the requirement of the documentation is a little bit more different. Um, in order for us to go ahead and take an application, we look at several things when it's an heirs property and it's that the claimant for that exemption um, for ownership purposes, they will have to be somebody who made this their permanent residence as of January 1st of the year they want to claim the exemption. And they are sole heirs within that will for immediate grant. Um, my suggestion for anybody who's filing an exemption on an heirs property is following the year of the deceased individual, file an application with our office, regardless of whether you initiate a probate or not, because our we need to have an application on record because we could always go back to grant an exemption as long as we have an application. If we don't have an application, we're unable to do that. My suggestion is go ahead and bring any proof of documentation you have, like copies of death certificates, if well, if there is one present, and of course your residential documentation to claim this exemption and our office will go ahead and facilitate the process for that year that you're filing. Thank you, Lolly. The next question is, do any of these programs assist with helping get people get housing? Do any of these programs assist with helping people get housing? I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. <laughs> um, so this isn't about getting housing. This is about retaining housing in families. Um, and, however, um, there is, the county, Alachua County, is um, working on a number of efforts around affordable housing. And the city of Gainesville is as well. And so... While this in particular effort isn't about finding housing for people or trying to point them towards affordable housing, we do have other programs for that. And so I'll let Chelsea take over if she wants to talk about the city's programs. And if you aren't living in the city of Gainesville, but you're in the county, um, please reach out to me. Um, my email is my first initial and my last name, which is on the screen at alachuacounty.us. And I can put you in touch with our team that does our housing efforts. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Prezia. Um, so our Housing and Community Development Department has a homeownership program, SHIP. You're probably familiar with it. They can offer down payment assistance. Um, our department, um, GCRA, also has a program called the um, My Neighborhood Program. And that program offers funding to help people move back into uh, certain neighborhoods um, we offer up to $25,000 towards the purchase of a home or vacant lot in, um, in certain neighborhoods and east side and downtown area. I think Porter's, Pleasant Street, Fifth Avenue, Duval, uh, Cedar Grove, Sugar Hill, uh, Spring Hill. Um, no, those are, those are some current options, though. Again, I guess... Summary, get in touch with our Housing Community Development Department. Um, uh, I, if you call my number, I can route you to them. Uh, my number is 352-647-6671. Thank you, Chelsea and Anna for clearing that up. Um, the next question is, should I hire a lawyer to assist in planning for probate and or estate planning? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so let you know, at least you know what you're doing, um, <laughs> which I'm guessing on here you don't. So yes, <laughs> I, is, did, I did my own will and it was, and you know what they say for someone who has themselves as a client, right? <laughs> so yeah, you, it's probably better to go with, to go to someone who knows what they're doing and it's well, it should be um, a really good investment because you can avoid a lot of costs down the line. As I said, I have seen well, well intentioned, um, you know, somebody's, somebody's family member went and got a will, so they're trying to copy that, but everybody, so we all say that the world, you know, you can't put a round peg in a square hole. 
I say the world is round, is round and we're all pegs, but we all fit in there differently. So just because your family member did something doesn't mean it's right for you. Um, and I, I, I've got horror stories of people who were well-intentioned and it didn't work out. So please see somebody about that and don't write your own, don't write your own deeds. <laughs> Two dogs. You got Two dogs. <laughs> All right. The next question is how do, how much does it cost to probate heirs property? Ooh. For Three Rivers and through um, the GCRA, uh, the, because they come to us, uh, we don't charge. Um, I was in private practice. I've been with Three Rivers three years now. Prior to that, I had my own practice. I can tell you it runs the gamut. Um, if you look at the statutes, um, there is a guideline for, uh, for attorney's fees, but not all attorneys do that follow that. A lot of attorneys will charge by the hour. So, um, but you have to weigh the cost. And so there, there are income requirements for both Three Rivers and for the GCRA component. Can you all share what those are? Yes, let me pull it up. I can do a screen share. I think Three Rivers is a little bit more complicated, but ours is pretty simple. Um, all right, so the, I, we do it by family size. And so you have to make under, so if, for example, you have two people in your household, you have to make under 70,275. Um, this, is, this is the chart and you can, see the uh, people listening into the webinar can see if you qualify for our program. Thank you. And so once you qualify through the GCRA, as I said, then they send it to Three Rivers and we do the work. Um, we do not charge um, the city's paying our fees. Um, if you're coming to Three Rivers and you're outside of the GCRA, we do have lower income um, our restrictions are tighter because we are based on the national poverty level. However, we are working with many grant funders, um, and sometimes we have a grant. Um, you know, grants come and go, and sometimes we have grants that are, don't have the income restrictions. Um, and it depends on if you're elderly. We have some Title III um, funds that we can we can help you with. So, um, if you qualify. With Three Rivers, you will not pay anything um, for our services. So even if someone's not sure if they're in the income level, they should contact you to see if you might contact. Help yes. So you will be, you'll, uh, you'll be, your call will be answered by an in intake specialist. She'll ask you some questions, um, and then if you qualify or they feel that, that we have a grant, you will be. Um, most likely sent directly, your, your file will be sent to me. Otherwise, we'll set you up with what we call a helpline attorney who will talk to you in a little more detail, get some more information. Um, that attorney will um, also determine whether or not um, it's something that we handle. You have to, in, in order to be in our project, you have to have a homestead. Um, it's not for the extra property or... Um, vacant land, commercial land or anything like that. It, it has to have a homestead. Or if the homestead had burnt down, I did have a case come across. <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay, thank you. The next question is, do I need to file a new homestead exemption this year? My spouse passed away February 22nd, 2022. So they passed away this year. Um, well, <laughs> He was alive January 1st of 2022. Therefore, the exemptions or any tax benefits on that home will continue for the year of 22. Now, we are talking in regards to a surviving spouse. So there is additional benefits that come in with that for the following year. 
Um, my suggestion in any case is always submit an information obligation for the property appraiser's office. And in this case, submit it with a copy of the debt certificate because we do have widow's exemptions for tax break purposes. And it wouldn't be available for the 22 year, but it will be available for the 23. So it's kind of like a proactive measure. We're trying to be make sure we don't forget things because that's sometimes what happens. If we don't do them on the spot a year later, we'll completely forget. Also, it's... Um, We've noticed that a lot of our original applicants were only one applicant submission. So we will have the, the husband's information and social security in our database, but we won't have the surviving spouse. So we want to avoid come next year if we don't have that information, we will have to contact you. And if we can get, get a hold of the surviving spouse, then that property ends up without a tax break. And we want to avoid that because then it's a year prolonged of corrections to try to get your tax back to what it was. And if you still have a mortgage, you know, your mortgage increases, we're trying to make sure people can afford their homes and keep them as affordable as possible. And that goes in tight end with your tax exceptions and breaks. It'd be a good idea if, um, especially for couples, um, look and see if your deed says husband and wife. It is so vitally important um, that if you're a husband and wife, that deed should reflect that you are, and it has to say husband and wife or John Doe and his wife, Jane, or something like that. And then check with the property appraiser's office and make sure they have that in their records. Um, so you may then still qualify for the widow's um, deductions and things like that, but you won't have that problem of a gap in your, um, in your taxes. And you may not have to probate your estate, his estate. But if it's held just by, in just the husband's name, you are very likely going to need to probate that and get it transferred into uh, wherever it needs to go. And there's all sorts of homestead limitations on what can happen to it. So you want to find out exactly how you hold it, how he held it. Uh, right. And, and if you are married and you're not on the deeds, have that serious conversation because what happens is when one spouse dies, let's say the, the spouse who has the name on the deed dies and there are children, whether they're yours or his or hers or anything like that, the surviving spouse only gets a life estate. That means you get to stay on the property until you die. And then it goes to those children. So again, if you have questions or anything, you can call us um, and, and qualify and we can help you through that. But that's one of those estate planning tools. We're, we're growing out of the husband owning the property and taking care of the wife. Um, but remember, a lot of times women live longer than their spouses. <laughs> so even if you're not on the mortgage, both parties should be on the deed as husband and wife. So look at those deeds. We can help you fix them. That's part of, um, we don't just do probate. We do, do the estate planning. And that's part of the estate planning. I, right. I, do, I do want to say that the uh, there is case law that if the husband's and wife's names on it, even if it doesn't say husband and wife, it is still considered tenancy by the entirety's property. But still, it's better to have it say that so you don't have to go through proving that up. And if you're not sure what the deed looks like, I highly recommend you go to the Alachua County Property Appraiser's website and do a property search. Just type in your husband's name. Um, it's very easy and you should be able to pull up uh, the, the record and uh, find out how it's held. You can even click down below if it's, it hasn't been that long ago since the property was acquired. You can even see the actual deed um, with the exact language, which uh, is very is highly recommended. And if it's old, go to the proper, uh, go to the courthouse. Um, there's a lovely ladies in the, uh, uh, the uh, public records down there that'll help you find your deed. Yeah. Yes, they will. <laughs> All right, the next question is, how many people can be listed on a deed? How many people can or how many people should? <laughs> that is a very good question. I've got a personal representative's deed with 34 people on it. Yeah, not, that is not good. That is not good because if one of those people dies, 
between opening probate and closing probate, now you've got 39 people on that, you know, potentially involved. So it was a personal representative's deed. So it was already. Yeah. And how much is each each interest worth? You know, one (laughs) percent. $1.95. $1.95. Like it was 1.01 1. and 1.09. 1. It was crazy. Right. So, so that gets, to, I think, back to the point that I made earlier, which is when you're thinking about estate planning, people who have just one child and they want the house to go to that one child, it's a really simple process. It should, there's multiple tools available. It should be fairly simple. If you've got seven kids, um, and you, 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 you got to think about how you want to do that because it's not always the best answer to say, I'm going to give equal shares to all seven of them. Um, it may in fact be the better answer to say, I'm giving the old bowling shoes to this one and I'm giving the house to this one and I'm giving the car to this one and this one gets the Cheerios in the cabinet and that's all. But you, know, you really, it's better to sort of separate it out because think about this. If you die without a will, and you have seven children, your children are entitled to one seventh. Each child is entitled to one seventh of everything. So technically, technically, that means one seventh of the sofa, one seventh of the TV, one seventh of the box of Cheerios, which you could probably divide up the Cheerios, but you can't divide <laughs> up the sofa and the, and the refrigerator and the TV. So we don't normally do that, right? But it, it, you know, we, normally what would then have to happen is that we would have to sell everything sell it all because you can divide up the cash, but that house is really hard to manage when it's in seven names and certainly when it's in 34 names. So if you're thinking of estate planning, please think about how you can narrow the number of people that are going to own the real estate. You know, you can give someone else the car, give them your love, but maybe it makes a lot more sense to just narrow it down as much as possible to simplify things. And we have those frank conversations with you when you come into our office and um, I send you away to say, think about it. (laughs) We have so many questions, guys. So we're going to kind of speed it up a little bit. Okay. um, Answer as many questions as we can in the next few minutes. Um, one of the questions is, I forgot to apply for a homestead exemption. I forgot to apply for the exemption. Can I submit an application in the middle of the probate process? Um, the answer, the simple answer to that would be yes. Um, my suggestion is submit an application at the beginning, at the end, in the middle, whenever you think of putting it, submit an application. The problem is, Without an application, the property appraiser has no jurisdiction to grant you an exemption. And whether we're talking about a current year or we're talking about two years or three years before, without an application, there's nothing we can do. There is, you don't submit an application to this office, there's a waiver of the exemption request by law. So you're waiving your rights to an exemption. Submit an application to our office in the middle of probate, no problem. You still need to go ahead and submit the required documentation, for example, copy of that certificate will and proof of residential factors of this home. All right, I think we answered this question, but it, here it is again. Can we manage to do our own probate or is there an affordable way? <laughs> that's, that's a two-edged, two-edged no, sword affordable again. Affordable ways to not do it yourself. I mean, I guess... In order to get through some of the questions, I guess, Aisha, I wonder, we've got, I mean, a lot of those questions have been, I'm looking at the list of questions I have anyway, I know, and a lot of them have been answered, like that one, like, you should get an attorney, and we have free services available for those who qualify. I don't, and so I don't want to miss ones that we haven't answered. Do we, I'm trying to look. I do, I do want to say that the people that I've seen that try to do it themselves, it's very difficult and they're often not successful. And sometimes those cases get dismissed. So you really shouldn't get an attorney to help you. And I've, I've sat in the probate court. So in Alachua County, when you go in front of the court, there's a magistrate, Magistrate Floyd, who is wonderful. She's very patient. Um, she can't give you legal advice, but if she tells you, she thinks it's a good idea for you to go get an attorney. She can't tell you to do that. But if you read between the lines, she's telling you, you need an attorney. Um, 
even if it's a summary administration, the problems are that we see is there, there's always a question. I, I do a lot of summaries, but there's mortgage companies that have to be dealt with. So we have to, even in a summary administration, we have to have a personal representative appointed in order to talk to that mortgage company. So a lot of our questions, as I was going through these, the uh, uh, Dr. Wright will appreciate this. The, 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 the law school answer is, it depends. <laughs> Everything is, it depends. Because again, the world is round. We are all pegs, but we fit in there differently. Um, so at least try to consult with somebody, with an attorney before you begin that process. Um, you don't want to get halfway through it, waste your time and have to start all over again because you didn't notify somebody. Uh, because remember, you, we're dealing with property rights. We all have a constitution right to our property and the government can't take it away unless we tell them or we give it to them like in a mortgage. Um, so we all have a right to be told when our siblings are probating. All right, the next question. Thank you, Rachel. Um, will we lose the property because of erroneous taxes? Is it a lien for several years considering delinquent taxes? Um, I'll take over this one. Um, so will they lose the property for paying erroneous taxes? The answer to that, and, and and then it shall be the answer will be no. Now, a tax lien is considered delinquent taxes. When they are recorded, they are recorded with a box. They go into the tax recorder's office as delinquent because there are taxes that are not paid. There's an excess taxes that are being claimed from the property owner because they possibly claimed an exemption or they failed to report to the property appraiser that the original exemptee had passed away. Um, in this case, they they don't lose the home. Um, my suggestion is contact the tax collector's office and make a payment arrangement in regards to paying your back taxes. They are not a tax certificate, so somebody cannot come in and purchase those. So they will have to, like I said, contact the tax collector in regards to that portion. Now, I do encourage that if at any point there is any changes on who claimed that original exemption to notify our office to avoid seeing yourselves here. Like we're saying, we're trying to make sure you keep the home. So the less issues that we have tax exemptions wise is the best. Thank you, Lolly. Um, the next question is, if listed as a as joint owner with rights of survivorship on, on property deed, what happens when I when one person dies regarding taxes or value? I can say on that one that um, if it's the, if the person dying has the homestead exemption, then um, the taxes may change um, because they would lose the homestead exemption. But whoever's left as one of the rights to survivorship, um, it just continues. The one falls off that has deceased and the others remain on there. And, and I think what you really have to do is take a death certificate down to the to the property appraiser's office and file that. Is, is that correct? Um, and then the you record it. Record you it. Record right? the, yeah. You can record it or we also do vital statistics here in our office weekly. Um, and if we find one of those, we then take the deceased off. Okay. And then it's just owned entirely by the survivor. Right. But for title purposes, um, and I used to do title reviews and things like that. For title, um, you have to record the deed. Um, and, and that's always done in, in any probate when there's multiple people on a, on a deed. Uh, because it helps with the chain of title to show, like, if it's husband and wife, we record the husband's deed if he's... Or, death certificate if he died to show that now the wife owns that property. Yeah, you don't need a deed. Uh, so Rachel, you sort of misspoke that. Right. You, you, yeah, death uh, certificate. The death certificate. Yes. And then they'll, they'll take care of it for you. That's what's so right. nice about both the Lady Bird deed and the joint tenancy deed is it's a very simple process to get it titled in the name of, of the next person. You don't need to go through the probate process. Right. Right, thank you. Next question is, how do I designate beneficiaries for my house? In your will. No, no, I just, <laughs> so there's two ways. 
there's two ways. One is to, to write a will and designate who you want to have take the property. Then you have to probate it. The other way is to go to a lawyer and get a ladybird deed executed, where, which designates the beneficiary who will take it at your death. Um, the ladybird deed is, a, um, it's been around in Florida for a long time, but not a lot of lawyers have been doing it. In fact, I never even heard of it until about 10 years ago. We didn't teach about it, but lawyers are doing it and it's much more common these days. Um, and so, but you need a lawyer because the lawyer needs to actually execute it, right? Like, like it's a document, it's a, it's a legal instrument and it requires not just the, um, the legal description of the property, but you need to spell very carefully what powers are being retained and who the beneficiary is going to be. So um, you would want to go to a lawyer, but it's not an expensive, uh, generally expensive. speaking, it's not an expensive process. So if you have, you just want one or maybe two people and all you have is your house, I highly recommend talking to someone about a ladybird deed. And we talk to people after we've done probate, sometimes, um, it's a tool that, and there's also what's called a quick claim deed with enhanced life estate that doesn't have the ladybird deed. We'll talk about, you know, with, with them. Um, it depends on your situation. And sometimes we offer one or the other, depending on who it is you're leaving the property to. And for the purposes, one of the things with the ladybird deed that just like your will, if the person you're given the property to passes away before you, you need to go back in and change that because when you die, then that goes to their estate. Now you've created some problems <laughs> that you're trying to avoid. Um, so always, always, always consult because we tell you all of this stuff. Um, you know, we, our consultations mean that we consult with you to find out what is your situation personally and what are your personal goals. Rachel, I have a follow-up question. Yes. Um, I have a Lady Bird D with my child's name on it. Um, what does she need to do to transfer the title on my death? Um, so again, so she all she has to do is record your death certificate and the property search. That's exactly what a Lady Bird D does is I'm giving you my property, but I get to live on it. And it's what we call contingent. If I have it, when I die, you get it. Because I can mortgage it, I can paint it, I can move it, I can do whatever I want until I die. And if I have it, when I die, you get it. So all she would have to do is record the, the mother's death certificate and, and it's automatically hers. The beauty about the Lady Bird Deed is you can change your mind and record another one or somehow record if you want to do just a regular quick claim deed or enhanced life estate or something like that, you can do that. It gives you the, the, the freedom to do with your house as you want right now. And if you still have it and you've given it to that person, they get it. But there's no probate required. So the person, right. your beneficiary just goes down, records a death certificate and it's hers. You know, right. easy, easy lemon squeezy, as I say. Next question is, do all heirs need to be listed on property for Three Rivers Legal Service Assistance? No. So when one of the heirs, the, the person that we call our client is usually the one who's living in the house. Or if it's, we have some properties that are not habitable yet and they're trying to get a ship loan or, or some kind of rehabilitation loans, but it's the person who's going to be living in the house. That's the goal. Now, sometimes, often, all the heirs do end up on the deed or on the title, but our client's the one who's gonna be living in the house. Um, so again, we're, we're creating an attorney-client privilege um, so sometimes we do talk to the other family members, but it's in the context that this one person is my client. I can't give everybody else advice, but I can tell you, you know, you need to sign this document. And I tell them, I'll get your own attorney if, if you have any other questions. Okay, thank you. Once probate finalizes, do I need to reach out to the property appraiser's office regarding my exemption status? 
The answer to that will be yes. My suggestion is once you go ahead and finalize your probate, contact the property appraiser's office in regards to either the application you originally submitted with us for us to initiate a tax correction process and you can benefit from this property taxes as soon as possible. Or if you in the case forgot to apply or were not aware that you had to apply for a homestead application, we can go ahead and initiate the process for you for the current year. I'm not sure if we answered this one. Do you need to file for probate after the spouse is deceased? Did we answer that? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. It depends how the property is held. It depends on what the spouse is, is taking. So it depends on whether you have a blended family and children by, a, by another spouse. Uh, it can be very complicated or it can be very simple. But the idea of estate planning is that you don't have to do it when the first spouse dies, knock on wood, if you did it right. But um, if you haven't done any estate planning, then you may need to. And it is important that if a spouse dies, that you contact an attorney within six months of the, that spouse dying um, to make sure that one, you're on the property, or there is a mechanism that if you're not on the property, we can get and we can get you at least your spouse's half interest. I know that's a lot of stuff, but please, I see so many people that wait way too long to probate, and it's it gets more complicated. The longer you wait, the more complicated it gets. You've even missed some deadlines, or more people have passed away. <laughs> and then you end up with those 45 people on a D. All right, next question. Should property go into a living trust for a minor child? What is the estimated cost for setting up a trust? A lot of money. <laughs> um, but I thought, so, so yes or no. So, so there's one, you can establish a trust during your own life. Um, and so if you have a fair amount of property, it's probably not a bad idea to just do it. And then if you have minor children when you die, the, those minor children will be taken care of. You've sort of done a big comprehensive estate plan and the whole thing is gonna work under that umbrella. Another option you can do is if you write a will, you can say, if any of my children are minors at the time of my death, please hold this in trust for them. And so you don't actually have to set up a trust unless it actually happens that you die and have minor children. And then the court will help establish a trust for those children until they reach a certain age. So it, it really does depend on what, you, what your goal is and what you want, um, how much property you have, what are the odds that you're gonna have a, that you're gonna die with a minor child. Um, you know, and, and so different things to think about, but the more property you have, um, especially if you have multiple pieces of real property, you want to be thinking more along those lines, I think, toward a, a, a trust, because that just puts it all in one nice, nice package tied up with a bow and everything just gets taken care of much simpler. Dr. But right. I have a follow up. Um, what's the safest place to store um, a will or a trust? A safe place, <laughs> the safest place in your house. Um, do not put it under the television. I have a case in my case book where, you know, somebody died and they were moving the television and there was the will. No, don't do that. You want to put it in a safe place with your other financial papers. Um, I don't necessarily recommend a safe deposit box, although you can you put a safe deposit box if you have a copy in your house somewhere. So people know that it's in the safe deposit box because they can't get to the safe deposit box if they haven't opened probate. So you, you know, you you want to make you want to make the will of it easily available, but not where it's going to just get washed away in a hurricane. You want to so, make sure that other people know that you have a will and where the will is and give them copies of the will so that they can find it later when they are looking instead of guessing. So but here's what happens when you do have a, a safe deposit box. I always suggest maybe the personal representative be on there. Um, if, you, if not, we have to go to court and get a court order to open the safe deposit box. And the court charges $400 for that process. It's a separate petition. Once that's done, the bank representative will make a, an inventory and give the court an inventory of what's in the box. They'll give, they'll hand you the will, but everything else stays in there. And then 
you go open probate, which is another process. So you actually have to have two processes. Um, so I always recommend if they're going to do that, have somebody else on that box that has keys that can get in there so we don't have to get the court order to have them open it. All right, thank you. Um, Lolly, can you answer this question for us? Once I receive the exemption, will my taxes be the same as before? Smart answer to that will be no. Now, I, I know taxes are individual and exemption is individual. So when you file for an exemption, the original applicant, we, we take into account the amount of years they had that exemption and possibly of the tax benefits they, that they had along with it. So when you inherit a home, you're, initi you're initiating your own exemption per se. So you're, we'll you will receive it as of the day of the person passing. That will be your initial year of tax break. So you, you can't expect to pay the same that somebody else did in this case. So per se, your taxes will not be the same. Now you will be covered with a tax exemption on the home. Thank you, Lolly. If someone died and two of the three people on the will are dead, how does the third person handle that? It depends on how the will is written. Um, and again, this is where I find a lot of problems. They forget to go back and say, if this one dies, then it goes here. If this one dies, it goes there. It depends on what that third person is supposed to get. Um, and so it is so important when you have a, a, a life event, a birth, a death, um, serious illness, um, disabilities, things like that. Look at your estate planning and see if some changes need to be made. Divorces are a good time to... <laughs> So for those, Florida has changed its law years ago a little bit that says that if you were married when you wrote a will or your beneficiary on your insurance and you divorce and you named your spouse as a beneficiary, that spouse is now considered to have predeceased you. So other provisions in your will kick in. So um, a, a, a will is a living document. It only becomes set in stone when you die. So you need to keep that copy somewhere where you're going to look at it every once in a while um, and think about, you know, do you like your in-law? Your child's married somebody who <laughs> you're not real fond of. So do you want them to have their stuff now? Um, it, you have to keep, these are things you have to keep. You can sleep well at night, but you have to look at it every once in a while. I think I get people all the time that are asking me, you know, they, so in this case, it's not uh, in a will, but even if it's in a will and somebody leaves the property one fourth to each child, you know, child number three wants to know why I can't have the property of uh, number one and brother number two, and that's not the way it works. Now, I mean, a will can be written that way, the survivor of these people, but if it's not written that way, then you're going to have to probate those other people's estates. Right. All right. The next question is, are there any cases where the original homestead and application year stays on the property after the original applicant passes? Yes. Yeah, so kind of to tie in this um, question with the previous one I had, there is some provisions in the statutes in regards to homestead exemption and inheriting that original exemption year, which is what we call the Saver Homes Cap. So originally when you file for homestead exemption, you also receive the second year of the Saver Homes Cap, which is a tremendous savings for property owners. Um, there is provisions for surviving spouses and minor children at the time of death. So those are the only two exceptions that the law provides that in the absence of the original applicant, they will be entitled to the original exemption, meaning they will inherit those, that cap and the property will not be reassessed. So they will continue receiving the taxes as they were as of the time of death of the original applicant with the original, with the significant increase that they usually see on a year to year basis. All right, thank you, Polly. Is, when is a pour over will a person's best option? 
So a pour over will demands that you have a trust. When we talk about a pour over, it's a, you're taking everything you have in, in your estate and pouring it into your to your trust. If you don't have a trust, the will means nothing. So pour over will is really just a piece of a much larger and more complicated estate plan. The reason we have a pour over will with the trust is a lot of times people, you'll forget to title something in a trust. So when you set up a trust, and again, this is where a lot of trusts fail, even ones that are done with attorney's help, um, you have to title everything you own into the trust. So the trust owns everything. If you leave something outside the trust, then the trust doesn't, doesn't direct where it goes. The pour over will picks that up and literally is pouring that asset into the trust because the trust is the beneficiary of your, the, the trust is the beneficiary of the will. So it says, oop, I forgot it goes into the trust. Um, and that's what a pour over will is. All right, we're gonna see how many questions we can ask in five minutes. Answer, <laughs> um, all right. Um, what can I do to ensure our children do not have to be in probate at all? Establish a trust? That's a good way. Yeah, a trust, um, a ladybird deed. It really depends on what property you have. So if you have a lot of real, if you have a yacht, if you have um, property that's titled and held by, you know, the title documents exist somewhere. So bank accounts, securities accounts, land, the yacht, the car, the RV, those kinds of things, you, all, you have to get those retitled in the name of someone else. And so a trust is a good way to, to facilitate that happening. But if the only thing you have that's actually gonna, that really needs to be retitled is the house, then something like a ladybird deed um, is really effective for that. And so you can put a beneficiary designation on your bank account. You can go down to motor vehicle with the death certificate and get the car transferred. It just really depends on what property you have, um, whether you need to uh, think about a trust, whether a trust is the best option or not. And that's something that only the lawyer can tell you. And what's the minimum age for Lady Berkey? 18. 18. You can't, in, in Florida, you cannot, a child cannot own property of their own because they're not of age to contract for services and things like that. So I do have occasionally people say, well, I want to put my children on there. Like, but what happens if you walk out of my office and you get hit by a bus? These kids can't take care of that property. Um, so, you know, again, in your will, if you do have young kids, you're going to want to name a guardian, um, especially if you're divorced. You, you need to appoint a guardian because if something happens to your ex, you need to tell who's going to take care of these kids. Usually if your husband and wife, if one passes away, the other is the natural parent. You know, we have blended families, we have half children, we have stepchildren. These all can be dealt with in a will. All right, thank you. What are conditions considered or things to look out for when passing properties to non-US citizens? You, your non-U.S. citizen, I don't practice in, in international laws, but I do know, you know, non-citizens may not be entitled to some of the exemptions. Who's living in the property? Um, there may be, um, there may be consequences for that non-U.S. citizen in their country as far as taxes and ownership of property and stuff like that. You need to consult with an attorney who knows international laws but there's no reason, I mean, the property can pass to someone who's a, not a citizen. It's just how you get it there and how hard it is to get it there that can be a, that can be difficult. And let me tell you, I've had to probate an estate with people who were in Spain. Very difficult to get service and very difficult to make them understand what probate is because in Spain, they there are no words that translate, that the, it's a it's, it's just not a concept. And that's, that's going to be the same in a lot of countries. They're, they You just don't understand something that doesn't exist. 
Okay. What are the differences in passing on properties under an individual's name versus an LLC? So it really depends on how you own the property, right? So I can own the property as an individual. Me and my spouse can own property as a married couple. Um, my corporation can own property. My trust can own property. So an LLC is a way of owning property because the LLC hopefully doesn't, presumably doesn't die. You don't have to necessarily go through probate with that process, but there will be people in the LLC who are managing the property and can sell it if need be. But it's really about, and, and this gets back to the idea of probate. The only property that has to be probated is property that you own, that the decedent owned in his or her own name at death. So if you give it all away, feel free to give it all away during life. And then you don't, there's no probate, but that's because you then don't own anything. Of course, then you kind of are like King Lear and you're suffering because you're at the, you have to uh, rely on the kindness of your children, but it really is corporations own property, partnerships own property. There's lots of other ways to own property than just as an individual, but we're really talking about what an individual owns. Right. And in, in this context, when you're talking about, you know, an LLC versus a trust, and I'm sure the property appraiser can answer this better. I know that you can have your home in a trust and you still get the tax exemptions for homestead, but I don't think that an LLC, we used to, I used to do a, a real estate, I worked for a real estate firm and we did land trusts for investors where we're putting it in separate, but they weren't homestead. Um, I don't think an LLC can get the homestead exemption, whereas if you put your home in a trust, you still hold on to that exemption. Yeah, um, yeah, Rachel, you're correct. Um, when into a trust, there's always a natural person in which you can deposit that beneficial interest for them to claim the exemption and possessory rights on the home. There's a legal limitation with an LLC as to who to identify as the natural person to grant them best that not only ownership, but residency, who can take possession of that home. All right, thank you. In his will, my dad left me his interest in his family's heir's property. How do I get my share? Well, if dad, if, if dad died, you have to probate it. Or if he's still alive, he can deed it to you. But, you, but it may very well be that your dad never or or his siblings never probated that piece of property so it's sitting there in grandpa's name or great grandpa's yep. name um in which case um you if you are legally entitled even if it's through a couple of predecessors of ancestors you can still open probate in grandpa's estate because you have an interest but you're going to have to show um you're going to have to open dad's estate you're going to have to probate that show that you are entitled to it that's where you get these very long, complicated probate proceedings. And we do that quite often. I will get one case and I will have two or three probates. Um, or we go back, we see, again, deeds were done incorrectly and have to open or reopen probate in some places. I have horror stories. <laughs> probate as soon as possible to, to avoid that. Okay, the next question is, if I apply for exemptions, what happened to all the years? Um, I didn't receive homestead exemption because probate was in process. So um, ultimately what happens is, as long as our office received an application by law, we're able to go ahead and retroactively process a refund for up to four years. That means current year plus three years back. That's why I'm, I can emphasize more to ensure that you submit an application to this office. At the point, it might be under AIRS and we might not be able to give you the exemption at that point, but once probate is finalized and you contact our office, we're able to go ahead and not just remedy the current year, but if you had an application with us, we can refund you excess taxes that you pay for the past four years. Amen. The next question is, what must we do if we realize the county records are not reflecting under heirs? This Jean? Or Charlotte. <laughs> or Charlotte. Well, um, yes. all we need is a copy of the death certificate. Um, 
Like I said, we do vital stats. It's very important to us because of the homestead exemptions that we do vital stats. But if we don't get it, um, then um, recording the death certificate or bringing the death certificate to our office, we accept them both ways. All right, thank you, Charlotte. We have continued to receive to we have continued to receive a new renewal tax benefit card every year. Is that correct? Because it shows under heirs. That will be a no. Technically, unless you know you came into this office and you filed for an exemption and we told you you were granted or you received some sort of notification from our office, if you are not the surviving spouse or a minor child, there is something that's incorrect. There's a disconnect between the original decedent and our records, meaning that exemption is most likely not yours if you didn't apply for it. And we want to avoid you losing your home. So in that case, I encourage you to go ahead and reach the property appraiser's office. Like Charla said, you can come in with a copy of that certificate because you're going to see yourself into what we call previous questions asked about liens and so forth if you receive the erroneous exemption under somebody else's benefit. Okay, follow-up question. If we fail to notify the property appraiser's office of the death of an exemptee or owner, what happens to the tax exemption and the years of taxes paid with the incorrect amount? So the property appraiser um, will have to initiate a process what we call a, um, an intent to lien process, meaning we'll notify the property owner after or do review if you have to pay excess taxes. That means you were receiving an erroneous exemption. Some like. A, previously stated exemptions are individual. So if you don't apply for it, this exemption doesn't belong to you. And it also comes tied in with the continuation of the Saver Homes cap, which is how long you've had this exemption placed on the home. My suggestion, like I've been saying it throughout the night, is if somebody passed away, notify us, apply for your own exemption. I know that taxes are great if you had it under somebody else, because depending on the amount of years, they their taxes are relatively low. But keep in mind, if our office does realize that there's an erroneous exemptions in place, not only are we going to go ahead and try to get the excess taxes back, but we're, there's also penalties and interest that are involved within the process if the owner failed to notify us or an heir failed to notify us. So if they notify you, there's mm -hmm. no penalties? If you no, find. they have to notify us somebody passed away that way we can take the exemption off. So we're not even seeing in the spectrum of liens or anything like that. So we could avoid all that together. Now, if that did happen and they fail to notify the office, there's penalties and interest. It is the property owner or whoever inherited the home is their responsibility to cancel that exemption with our office. Thank you, Lolly. If I am the if I am the survivor of a veteran. Will my taxes increase now that he or she has passed away? If you are the surviving spouse of a veteran who was receiving a tax break on the home, there is provisions now in the statute that you will inherit that exemption. So surviving spouses do get to claim their um their spouse's benefits, whether it was a, the smaller spectrum of the exemption, which is the 10% or more, or if we're talking in relations to a total and permanent exemption of taxes, as long as they're the surviving spouse and that's how it's identified on the debt certificate, then they'll go ahead and be able to continue receiving that tax break. Thank you, Lolly. Well, that concludes all of our questions. Thanks. Thank you again for all uh, attending tonight and for all your participation in the webinar. If you have any further questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to our office. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.